to the IPython notebook revolution. This will probably be the most unusual IPython notebook talk. Um, if you go out to pyvideo.org, you can see a bunch of excellent talks by the people who actually made this stuff. They do a fantastic job. And I'm kind of going to do everything that they don't, which will make it a little bit different. This is probably f the only link you're going to need to find because um, speakerbar.com got an account. I got talk number two out of all the thousands there will soon be. And from there, there's a link to the GitHub repository that actually has these slides and the notebooks that I'm going to show. So you should be able to get all the materials there. I heard of IPython first quite a few years ago, just soon after I started Python. And what's IPython? Well, it's an interactive Python environment. And I said, I've got, you know, Python has an interactive prompt. What do I care? Well, IPython has tab completion. Okay, that's nice. Um, IPython has all these magic commands. And I looked at them, and that's all the commands that start with a percent sign. And I thought, well, that's nice. There sure are a lot of them. I'm really intimidated. Um, when I have time, I guess I'll, you know, look into what those are. In the meantime, ooh, shiny. And that was about my IPython experience for the next many, many years. Then, in 2011, notebook. <laughs> um, what is the IPython notebook? I don't need to go there. The notebook is, well, it's two things. It's there's the notebook kernel, which runs usually on your machine. It could conceivably be, be on a server. And then there's a client that attaches to it. Generally, we're talking about your web browser being the client that attaches to the kernel. It's then a mixture. It, it's a series of cells. Every cell is either markdown uh, or it's an actual IPython code cell. So, for example, we have one cell here, which is... Underneath, it's just the text that I'm displaying. In this case, um, it's rendered, however, as a nice heading cell. And then it has IPython cells, which I can execute and um, greet you all like so. And I keep on thinking I need to switch there, but that's not where I want to switch. 2011, it was actually introduced at Euro SciPy. I first saw it at PyCon 2012 when it was being used to demonstrate Pandas, which is a really neat library, but everybody came out of the talk saying, with their jaws hanging down, saying, what was that tool he was using? To I've never seen that. That was astonishing. And um, by 2013, IPython Notebook was all over PyCon, and it was just a major part of the buzz, especially to the PyData session, which followed PyCon immediately, which I unfortunately missed. In 2012... Fernando Perez was awarded the Free Software Foundation Award for, I guess, awesomest software of the year, which is certainly accurate. He keynoted, uh, Fernando is the create, original creator of IPython and still kind of, it's, it's Guido, and there are other people's in, people involved. Um, he keynoted SciPy this year, and I spelled it SciIPy intentionally because apparently it completely conquered the IPython conference, or the SciPy conference this year. And as of, I believe, last week, the 1.0 alpha version uh, was released, and that is what I'm doing most of my demonstration in, so this will be exciting. So the time has come. You need to get in involved with the IPython notebook or you are a counter-revolutionary. <laughs> now you'll notice there was lots about science in there, SciPy, SciPy, the... Fernando and all the other core developers come out of the scientific community. It's big in the sci at SciPy conference. If you go looking for demos and introductions, it's almost certainly going to focus on the scientific aspect. You're going to see gorgeous graphs uh, and things like that. And that's not what I'm going to show because that's been covered really well. I'm not. You should watch Fernando's talk. Don't watch me if that's what you want to see. And so there are really awesome graphing capabilities. If you want to integrate with Pandas, which is a great library for crunching large data sets, it's amazing. Parallel computing and Scython, our, our scientific computing friends are usually really concerned about CPU cycles, and IPython includes a lot of great tools to help them speed up their doings, and that's pretty much all you're going to hear about that stuff. If, you're, if those aren't what you do, you may have been in danger of losing interest in IPython Notebook, and that's I'm going to try to show you why it's relevant to all of the rest of us. 
The first thing is that it really can revolutionize the way you work. It can become not just a tool you pull up once in a while, but a tool that's going to be on your desktop every minute of the day when you're working with Python, and you're continually going to be turning to it. First of all, it's going to... Um, Python's, full, oops, Python's full of introspection. But with the notebook, you can really amp that up. So I want to import something. Um, right, Ari, that's what I want to import. OK, got it. I don't remember what's in Ari. So I'm going to look down. Oh, let's see. I'll just throw in something, because I'm not actually interested in it. But I'm demonstrating some of this. I don't remember what the deal is with Ari. What, what, what does Ari stand for again? Well, the question mark brings up the doc string. Doc strings are crucial to us, but the trouble is they can be a little inconvenient to get to otherwise. Um, function signatures can be a little tricky to get to, and that's always something I'm needing to look up. But the tab completion goes as far as if you hit the tab after you open a paren, you get the full doc string, including its function signature. And uh, hit tab again if it's longer than the little pop-up it gives you to get the, the full thing. And I'm just going to, that's going to throw in it. I want out of this cell and I don't want it to throw an error. Go away. Okay. Um, there are, all these commands that start with percent signs are the IPython magics. You'll hear a lot about them. They're either cell magics or line magics. One, parent, uh, sorry, one percent sign means it's a line magic. Two means it's a cell magic, which means it applies to the entire cell you're in. A lot of those have to do with introspection. The P in this case stands for print, so you can print the definition, print the doc string, print the contents of the file that the item is contained in. Um, P info and P info too, I think, are synonyms for a one and two question mark. Oh, that reminds me. I showed you one question mark, which showed you the doc string here. Um, two question marks, and you actually get, uh, now I just, I'm displaying the entire regex source code module. So our introspection is, we're having a great time with our introspection. Um, furthermore, what I'm always having trouble with is I can't remember what the names of my variables were. And so in IPython and the notebook, I can ask for help on something. and I don't even remember what it was. I just throw in an asterisk to give me, what, what are all my CO space? What's, what do I have defined in my namespace that starts that way? And in fact, that can go either way, and then I get a whole lot of possibilities. Now, you can also get information about IPython really easily. Probably the number one thing not to forget is the quick ref, which is just like a nice little IPython tutorial that's available right here with the quick ref magic. The only trouble is it focuses just on IPython itself, nothing about the notebook. Um, if you want to see a list of all these magic commands, that's the ls magic magic. And then if you want details about, say, any particular magic, you can ask for, um, ask for it this way. Um, you can also, the other way is you can, this respects the question mark too. So really easy to figure out what you're trying to do and why. The, oh, I think this, that cell is out of place. I think we're going to talk about that in a minute. The next thing you can do with the notebook is you can kind of throw out your bash shell or your whatever operating system uh, prompt you work from because you can do all of that from inside IPython. It recognizes most of these common um, commands like pwd, cd. Um, I can issue operating system commands just like that. In these cases, because these are really common ones, it's recognizing them just as they are. If it didn't, if you try an operating system command and it doesn't recognize it, prepend it with the bang that says, no, this is really for the operating system. Sends it out there and executes it. The, C, the directory handling, in fact, is a little more sophisticated in IPython than it is in the ordinary shell. Um, I'm kind of doing all these just to pop around and populate my little history of where I've been. Um, does everybody know that at least in Unix Linux you can cd hyphen and then that jumps back to the last directory you were in? 
So that's useful if you're hopping back and forth between two directories, but all of a sudden you're hopping back and forth among three or four, and it becomes useless. But it's not useless in IPython, because I, I just hit the tab after my hyphen, and now it gives me a history of all the directories I've been to in this session. And so I'm going to go back to where I was two hops ago. And so now my hopping is much. And in fact, maybe I don't want to bother figuring out where it was. I just remember that I was in a directory that contained the word project. So I cd dash dash project. And I'm there. Now I'm not getting lost nearly as much. Um, I don't remember why I was showing you these commands. I think just that here's some more operating system commands that it even uh, recognizes natively. And then tab completion works just fine. Whenever the context says I'm looking for a file, IPython recognizes that really just as well as Bash does. So you're good there. Of course, the number one thing we want to do at this, out there at the, um, in our shell is we want to run Python. And naturally, IPython is really good at running Python. Funny that. Um, I am going to see what I've got for Python. I have an air, read airlog.py script, and I'm going to run it. And pff, I forgot to reintroduce my error. OK, so I'm going to jump down here. I'm going to cheat. I want an error. Pretend, I, pretend we don't know this. OK, back to here. Um, run it, and I got an error. Oh, no. Why did I get an error? Why didn't I remember to run my Python with dash mpdb and on a long running thing? That will often be my curse because I come back half an hour later and <laughs> it died. Fortunately, in IPython, we can ask, and this, is only, this is only works in the notebook in 1.0. Is this my 1.0? I'm running two different versions. Oh, I'm running the wrong version. OK. <laughs> See, that, that was in IPython 0.13. Now let's get back down to um, 1.0, where I can run it. I get my error, some sort of error. I debug, and that throws me into the debugger. So what's the matter with uh, match.group5? Why didn't that work? Oh, I get it. I don't have that many groups. So would match.group2 work? Yes, it would work. And so at this point, I can go back, I can go into gedit. I wonder if I confused it. <laughs> I may have confused it by running two, different, um, running two different kernels at the same time in different versions. In any case, um, so I, I am just going to uh, make sure I can do this with Vim. Put the, putting this back to two the way it belonged. OK. Um, the other cool thing you can do, the load command actually reads that file into a cell. So that a lot of the time, that's the way I'm going to want to manipulate it inside the cell. And so that runs it right there. And it's really handy. And I don't know, I think I loaded that twice. So that's the only reason I have that here. Finally, I said I wouldn't talk about performance, but I very, very slightly lied. Um, Asking for help about run, it talks about some options we can pass. And two of those options are, I can ask for timing information when I run it. And so that basically does my time it. I can ask for profiling information. And granted, in this case, that's not that interesting. But um, if you are a performance concerned person, that's a really quick, easy way to start getting some performance information. All right. now. Before I go back to the slideshow, you saw me making mistakes, which is good. I meant to do that. I hopped around. When we do an experimental workflow, we make mistakes. With a normal REPL, REPL, REPL? A read eval print loop, REPL, um, there's kind of this assumption that you work in a line. I do A, I do B, I do C, I do D, I do E. But usually, if we're in a REPL, it's because we're experimenting. We don't really know what we're doing. I do A, I do B, I do C, I did it wrong. I do it again, I do it again, I do it again. Now I did it right. Where was I? Was I on B or did I do A yet? OK. I do A, I do B, I do C, uh, I do B differently, I do C, D. So by the time we finish that, we've lost track of what we've done, what we haven't done. We try, then try to reconstruct, then we open up 
an actual .py file, try to reconstruct what we blundered our way through, through those experiments, it works, but there's a lot of confusion. In the notebook, every cell we did is still right there, ultimately in the final form we did it, so not only can we keep track of where we are, see what we're doing, but there's also a lovely file, download as. And so I can dump that as a py file, and that becomes the core of the Python file I'm going to start writing, and it's already pretty much ready to go. I don't lose my experiments. Also, um, there's not an option to download it as .ipy, but if I just change the name to .ipy, then any special IPython commands, uh, magics and so forth, I can say ipython blah.ipy, and all those are going to run instead of um, complaining that it's not standard Python. All right. Now back to the slideshows. Yes. When you're working with the shell like that, yes. what user permissions are you interacting with the shell? It's, it, it is working as wherever you started the notebook. Um, that's just that's who you are. Okay. So um, you kick off the notebook from any old terminal session, and that's how it works. Another thing you might, I'm not recommending this, but another thing you can do from the notebook is you can run things that are not Python. In fact, there's a special magic predefined to let you run Ruby, for example. Um, yeah, right there in the cell. Uh, you can also run bash scripts. There's a bash magic. Um, you should not run bash scripts, not of any complexity. People only do that to show off their beards. Uh, <laughs> And you don't need to. You have a better option this time. So does anyone, has anyone done backticks in Perl? I miss that so much. I hate os.subprocess.popen uh, no, standard in equals blah or check out. I hate that. I really miss being able to just do something at the operating system level, plop it into a local variable, and, and be happy. And in Perl, you can do that almost as easy as you can in IPython. All we do in IPython is, um, well, you saw, the, you saw the bang saying, hey, operating system stuff coming here, and then you can stick it into a Python variable. And so we've got this list of all our notebooks in our directory. Because of that, yes? Does it, can you uh, delimit it? Uh, so Let's experiment on that one when I'm done. I don't, we will have to see. Um, I will show you mildly crazy stuff, but not quite that crazy. Um, because of all this, we can do hybrid scripts. Uh, so in this case, this is a perfectly legit Python loop, and within my perfectly legit Python loop, I'm calling out to the operating system. So I'm doing an LS on these three extensions. Okay. Uh, so I'm just showing you that I've only got one presentation file in my directory that contains uh, the underscore. Here I am, I'm doing, using the operating system to list out my files. I'm sticking that into a Python variable. Uh, that's a list. I'm looping over my list. I'm doing wonderful Pythonic goodness to the results of this list. Now I'm going out to the operating system. Now I'm going back and grabbing my Python variable, name stem, and now I'm not just grabbing the variable, I'm actually doing some Python operations here within my curly quotes. And then when I'm done, I'm listing my results. And so I just did, did a little copying and renaming with this wonderful, horrifying Frankenstein hybrid script. And I've, yeah, I've started to fill up my life with these interesting hybrid scripts. Which, and this is an example of, you know, when I save this, I don't save it as dot py, I save it as dot .ipy, or I just leave it in the notebook. And leaving it in the notebook means that I can keep my beautiful documentation around it and just run it from there. Those are both good options. Uh, this is something I already talked about. Yeah, I jumbled up my... Yeah, so I talked about matching the experimental workflow. And the other nice thing is you can keep your experiments. 
you were just messing around with something, but you're not totally sure you'll never touch it again. So you can save that notebook. In fact, you can make some nice markdown cells around it to describe to yourself what you were doing. Set that aside, and many times that will be really useful when you come back to a similar but not totally identical problem. So that's all how it can change the way you personally work. The next thing is it can change the way you work with other people. I think one of the ironies is that people think of computer programmers as very solitary. And I think even I, when I was starting out, thought it was pretty solitary. And it turns out we might be in the most social career on the planet because we are constantly borrowing stuff from each other, learning stuff from each other, teaching stuff to each other, getting ideas from each other. And all of that works a lot better with the notebook. Not particularly a revolutionary, as far as I know, but still, he agreed. Okay. Um, one of those ways is the rich output that it makes possible. Expressive documentation. You've seen a little bit of that. Markdown cells. Markdown, in case you haven't heard of it, is a markup format that is text-based, but it lets you do most of the goodies that you would see in HTML. In fact, the really neat thing is it's a superset of HTML. So. Anything that you can do in HTML is also legal markdown. I should, yes? Is it just using the normal markdown library or is it using the extra? Uh-oh, I've got no idea. Okay. Oh, well, sorry, the question was, is this the regular old markdown li library or is it using extras? And I don't know. That's a good question. Do you, do you want to try something that you know of that is not in the regular library? Sorry. <laughs> I'm not trying to get revenge. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Here's, here's just an example of uh, what Markdown often looks like. And um, you can include things like links. And this will not be a good link, but, uh, you know, I don't even need that. Um, oh, whatever. I'm linking to something. We're not going to. Um, and then it just renders out that way. And that gives me my garbage link. So you can start to build up these files that have chunks of code that are totally legitimate, executable. You run it right there. And then you also have really good looking documentation around that. Now let me. There are other tools that let you mix code and documentation. Sphinx is, of course, a fantastic one. Dexy is really intriguing, and I haven't had time to use it. But those are more one-way tools. You write the code, and you set up your documentation, you generate it, you put it out somewhere, and when you want to start the process again, you, you're not in a continual cycle. Whereas if you're doing this in a notebook, your good-looking documentation and your code are right there. They're together as you're experimenting. There's no separate step. And so they all become much more intimately married. And as for how far you can take this, there's actually a book. Oh. Oh, I don't have a link to the. OK. I want to bring this up properly in the book. Where did I put it? All right, well. No, this is, this is worth a minute. I want to find it. Good. Not a topic I know anything about, but this person has published a book as a series of notebooks. And so this is, this is good looking stuff. That looks like a book. And yet, the code cells, come on, where's your code cells? OK, here's the code cells. Somebody reading the book can go here, execute the code cells right in place, Tweak it right in place. You know, hey, you gave me an interesting idea. I'm going to throw in an extra code cell right here with some things you've suggested. And so the book you give people really becomes a living document. Would that work from a mobile phone? Um, you want to type code on a mobile phone? <laughs> it's, it's all each. Yeah. Um, it's all. Yeah. This is all just HTML5. A CSS, I see no reason why it shouldn't. Will it render beautifully? I'm not sure. That's an interesting question. Yes. Uh, what is it using to actually serve this? Is it using an external, like a, like a 
HTML server, or does it have something built in? It, it's built in. Okay. Um, and there's, I've not, in, in theory, you can use this to host it at one server and have people connect to it. I've none, never done that personally. I'm sorry. The question was, what is this being served with? And it's just, it's built into the IPython notebook. I, I agree. It blows me away. So let me see. Which of these tabs was I on? Oh, I see. All right. Then the other interesting thing you can do is um, the results of your computations, you can make them more interesting to look at and more communicative. So in this case, we're going to make a coin. Uh, the coin is flippable. We will use it to make decisions. Um, here we are using just plain old Python, and this coin reports its, when, when we just, uh, and with coin, it just reports its status. Okay, that's, that's kind of cool. But we want to actually see this coin. So the notebook includes this um, image. And an image, as defined in IPython display, actually knows how to display itself. So when we refer to it in the notebook, it gives us the image version of itself. So that's fairly cool, but not very object-oriented. Um, going to take it a little further. Repr, normally if I just say I at the, my Python prompt, it tells me back, okay, that's an object of type blah, 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 and here's its address. Not that informative. And you can override that by overriding the repr method and maybe make something that, uh, like I did before, it says coin that is tails. However, the notebook, when you do that, it looks for a special method. Why did you do that? Um, Repr, under, there's actually a variety of them, but <laughs> Repr underscore HTML is the particular one that um, I'm displaying here. Hang on, I'm going to see. Why did... You Thank you. Okay. In this case, it's going to go and return me some HTML, which is then going to be rendered. So now I have a, a prettier response. And I'm just going to take that a little further. And this time, my HTML is going to return the image file. So now I have a coin that actually looks really good when I play with it in IPython notebook. So this is one example. You know, science is the obvious example where you can have a data set that displays itself, but it's open to all of us doing, you know, business applications. The sky's the limit. Um, I mentioned that this is HTML5 and CSS and JavaScript, all that regular stuff, which means that anything that you can fit into a web page, you can stick into an IPython notebook. So, you can, there's actually a, a native way to include a YouTube video, which is, hi, Fernando, we love your stuff. Cool. Um, oops. Okay, and, and that's just how I embedded that. Um, all right, obviously... Here's another brief nod at the usual science stuff, just because it is pretty cool. I um, wanted to show you how easily you can get. So this is what this renders as, and it's just this easy to do the equation. Um, you know they wouldn't neglect to... Oh, pff, I showed it there. And the other way, you can, in addition to getting that out in a markdown cell, it's pretty easy to have your Python objects... Um, or your Python code emit this sort of equation. I'm going to take, a, give you a brief glimpse at um, a tutorial written. Here's an example. The other nice thing about the notebook is there's all sorts of documentation about it that's written in the notebook. It's a perfect teaching tool, and I will show you where the links to all that stuff is. So this is about how easy it is to do graphing in the notebook. Um, and, yeah, it doesn't just have to be simple graphs like that. This tutorial gradually gets wilder and wilder and starts to hurt my head. And I think there's some 3D at the end. Yeah, this is getting awesome. Um, so, yeah, if that's what you're into, you're going to go crazy when you get a look at that. And what's, I think perhaps even more important to the advancements of science, is somebody has worked out how to do uh, 
Okay. Now, now this, is, this is just an image, and this is the without mucking with it version in IPython, and then he mucks around until he's got, granted this is a lot of code, there. That's actually the output from this thing. So that's, yeah, yeah, that's pretty sweet. And, you know, aside from just the fact that we love XKCD, it really is that communicates the fact. If this is a rough calculation, it kind of communicates the fact that we're not really talking science here, we're, talking, we're messing around. So it's a good example of how rich output is more communicative. All right. Um, who here has heard of D3JS? Uh, an awful lot of you. Okay, yeah, it's made a big splash. And I have to admit that when I saw it, I was a little, I was like, oh, how come the web people have to have all that fun? I want to have fun too. Um, but, okay, is this my, ooh, this will work in one of them and not in the other. It's depending on, and it's not because of a version thing, it's because one of them, one of them knows how to find my graphics libraries and one of them doesn't. Um, There we go. Okay. So this is all rendering in the notebook. Any D3JS will work because any JavaScript will work. And we have this JavaScript as a um, IPython function, which knows how to do that. Now, unfortunately, of course, this is a whole lot of JavaScript. And I think that we need someone to write a nice wrapper for D3JS that exposes it all with a nice Python API. I think that would be great. Um, so one of you get on that, please, quickly. Uh, D3JS, the question is, what is it? It is a JavaScript library for rich data rendering. Um, so Matplotlib can do astonishing things, but D3JS can do superhuman things. And um, it's... I don't know. It's, it's a little complicated to use, in my opinion, but that's because it lets you go down to a very deep level and do unimaginable sort of stuff. There's quite a few um, interesting intro infographics that have been done by the New Yorker lately that are, no, sorry, the New York Times, that are based on D3JS. And now you can duplicate all of those right here inside the notebook. Okay. Where are we next? Uh, social coding. Now, aside from just the other aspect of communication or sharing code is not just blowing them away when they see your stuff, but getting them involved and getting you involved. And one of the kind of trivial but nice things is you're off on the internet, you see someone demonstrates how to do something, you cut and you paste the code into Python, and of course it doesn't work because it includes these, um, uh, the, what do they call these marks? Brevets or carrots or whatever. Um, yeah, all, all this garbage that you have to strip off before it'll execute. Except in IPython, it'll execute just fine. It recognizes that as a paste, um, as paste garbage. Yeah. <laughs> Similarly, if you're pasting out of someone's notebook and it has all, and it picks up all these in, out marks, that's okay. It'll ignore those two and, and it'll execute just fine. Um, you saw, I, I showed you the load command before, but it doesn't have to be a local file. It can be a file out there um, if it has a URL. So I just, I just threw that little Python script onto my web page, and now it actually loads. So that's how I get other people's code. Um, but the next thing is to take it to them so that they will give you suggestions, feedback. They will start making their own variations. So how do we communicate the code to them? Well, you can give a presentation like this. This presentation is being pre done with the IPython notebook. It's a brand new aspect of it. Uh, the notebook now ships with a utility called nbconvert, which you can use it to dump a notebook to a regular HTML file, but there's also a version to dump it to a reveal.js presentation. So that's what all this is done with. And the only reason I keep popping out to a separate notebook is, well, I want you to see the live notebook, and I also want you to see things like tab completion, and that doesn't show up in the presentation. Um, so that's relatively easy to do. Uh, yeah, this is only with the brand spanking new Python 1.0. Then all you need is a cool regional presentation to get a regional conference to give a presentation at. <laughs> Let me think. Um, you can write blog entries. And as an excellent example, Fernando Perez himself has been blogging with the notebook and now his cells, the same sort of stuff that you can see in the notebook are right there in his blog. And his, I think, is hosted on Blogger and he includes the directions about how to do that. 
I always lose where I am. Ah, there we go. Um, but there are more examples of how to do this with varying blogging platforms in the gallery. And the gallery is something I'm going to briefly highlight right now. A gallery of interesting IPython notebooks. This is in, um, it's in the source code if you bring down IPython or it's linked to it from the IPython.org website. And it is a kind of ridiculously long list of notebooks that people have done ridiculously cool things with, again, centered around the science stuff. Um, and since every notebook makes such a great teaching tool, this is a fantastic way to get not only ideas of what is possible, but um, really work with these to build your own stuff. So you're going to spend a lot of time in that gallery, and it's going to be good time. I mentioned NB Viewer. No, I mentioned NB Convert. All right. Um, what is a notebook underneath? It's a JSON file. It has. So, the next thing you can revolutionize is itself. And what I mean by this is there is an amazing future coming up for IPython, and I don't know what it is. There's going to be some fantastic things being, thank you, being developed for the notebook, and we've only started to see the first interesting hints of it. IPython is a, it's an architecture. I mentioned before that there's a kernel and then clients can connect to it. So it's not limited to a web client connecting to it. Already, um, oh, there's a magic that outputs the information that you need to connect to a given IPython kernel session. So there's some basic instructions here about how I could connect multiple IPython sessions. Um, so that opens up a lot of interesting possibilities. If you've seen the, uh, the IDE and thought canopy, that includes an I IPython notebook right there within the IDE. I understand that Python tools for Visual Studio can also run uh, in mysterious, whatever, spooky, yeah, yeah. Um, can also embed the notebook right within there. So that's an interesting possibility. It's really wonderfully hackable, and I'm just going to plug a couple of hacks and extensions that I have seen or written. Um, and I, like I said, I'm not an expert, which kind of proves that it's not too terribly hard to write an extension. Um, so for example, uh, IPython doc tester means that I can, oh shucks. There's an extension, by the way, to control the way the up page up and page down key. I don't really like the way it does by default. There's an extension that lets that work a little more the way you expect. Um, again, it's easy to write extensions, but I forgot to install it before the talk. Oh, well. Um, so I don't know if you're familiar with doc test. It's a, I think hardcore testers often hate it, but it's a really nice way to throw some quick tests in here, more for instructional purposes for anything than anything. So I wrote this up for the purpose of the uh, Python workshop for women to give people a really handy way to get feedback as they work on a function. Um, that's why it's full of these nice encouraging messages. So it tells me that I'm not quite there yet, and the reason is that I forgot to... Um, and now it tells me success. And the other interesting thing about this is, with just a couple of lines of configuration at the beginning, it can report its results up to a central server where the instructor can keep track of how everybody is doing on all the exercises. And, okay, this person's bored, this person needs help, and so forth, all seamlessly to the user. So, just a nice teaching tool. And then, inspired by this, but not by me, there is a Python nose, or IPython nose out there also, for people who like using kind of more proper test frameworks. But that's a way to test one cell at a time. Um, SQL, that's kind of my thing. So I, uh, oh, I didn't start my C Postgres, sorry. Do to do. I knew I would forget that. Okay, try this again. Yeah, that's the part that bothers me. So I use this, again, this is an extension. It was really easy to write. Relatively easy, a couple of insomniac evenings. Um, I'm connecting to a database using a SQL alchemy connection string, and I am running a SQL statement now, and not just a SQL statement, but one with a um, bind variable, which is helps my performance and 
protects me from SQL insertion I'll, or SQL injection, although SQL injection isn't relevant when I'm using a SQL client, but anyway. Um, and actually, each of these rows comes back as a nice Python object where each of the columns is defined, you know, has an attribute. So, nice way to make a SQL client. If any of you remember, I once wrote a SQL Python command line client, and now I've been neglecting it because I really I do my SQL queries in the notebook instead. Um, so that's cool. Matt Davis wrote another teaching tool called IPython Blocks, which does this. This is an HTML table, and there's a bunch of style sheet magic going on to make it into this nice little graphics playground where you can start messing with those blocks. You're not limited to 10 by 10. It can be 500 by 1,000 if you want to do you know, the Mona Lisa. That's no problem. Um, and that's a handy way to teach students, I think, it's not, it doesn't have to be static. I, there's a, IPython itself provides a clear output, which means you can display that grid and then clear it and then display it again. It works, these cells work asynchronously. So you can actually get some fairly sophisticated graphics and you can build it up one easy step at a time with the students seeing what they're doing every step of the way. I actually intend to write some tutorials that take advantage of this for some things like, um, illustrating how you do pandas data reshaping operations with 2D gra graphs and things. Okay. Now, <laughs> two of the most amazing demos, unfortunately, only sort of work. Um, oh no, I'm not there, sorry. Okay, is this the right one we're going to use? This, dip this is for demonstrating some hardware that I don't have, which is why it's throwing error messages like mad and not particularly working. But even the part that does work, I think, is insane. Um, oh, this is, okay, this is not the one. I think I'm running it in, again, in the wrong kernel. Well, I'm, I'm a little short on time, so maybe I'll verbally tell you. The part that does work, uh, even without the hardware, is that th this is actually registering clicks on the keys. And then if I had the right hardware connected, it would play notes off this piano keyboard, which is just insane. And he also made this lovely notebook, which again depends on some hardware that I don't have, because this is for um, measuring the rolling of a, of a ball down a plane to basically measure the gravitational constant. Oh, I'm, nothing's showing up here. But um, it's still a good example of the way this is a teaching tool where the equations are all in here, the um, computations are in here, and in his original version, he actually has it wired to the photo gate, to the magnet that releases the ball, and the photo gate that detects it rolling down the bottom of the plane. So just an, an example of out-of-the-box thinking of, on this. That was the gravity measurement. Um, so this opens up to us all sorts of things that only web programmers have been able to play with. And because we've got all the Python power, things that they've never been able to dream of. And I don't know where we're going with this. Um, I'm hoping that some of you are thinking of interesting things, or will start thinking of interesting things, and that we will see an amazing variety of IPython notebook innovations coming out over the next couple of years. So you definitely want to learn this. I, speakerbar.com, talk number two, is where you will take all the notes. But I mentioned the gallery. So again, that gallery of interesting notebooks is going to be one of your um, favorite learning resources. PyVideo.org has some excellent video. Yes, I think they're all filmed by you, Carl. Um, uh, excellent videos by the people who really know their stuff, Fernando and so forth. Um, like at there are long tutorials at SciPy, for example, that cover it very nicely. Um, one example of one that it's, it's linked to from here, the IPython in-depth tutorial at SciPy is all, all those notebooks are on the web, and so you can go download that notebook, run through it, and pretend you were there at SciPy being taught by Fernando himself. Um, don't forget about the, the quick ref, because that's just, you know, quick and easy reference material. And then feel free to email me with questions or with job offers. I'm looking as of next month. Um, and I actually finished in less than three hours. Very good. And I have time for questions.
So thank you for being an awesome audience and for being an awesome Pi Ohio. It just makes me want to cry when I see everybody here having a great time and learning stuff and teaching each other. It's, this, is, this is so awesome. So thank you for making... So questions? Yes? So, <laughs> so, so if you're using this as a teaching tool and you had a, a central server with people connecting, is there a way to lock it down so that people can't use like OS and start reading out? Yeah, um, there is documentation on how to use it centrally. That is more courageous than I've done yet. And what I've done as a teaching tool is actually to distribute, um, get it on everybody's network notebook or on everybody's laptop because I want them to keep using it after the class is over. Um, also then that in itself is a little tricky but fortunately Continuum Analytics publishes Anaconda which is a packaged up version of Python that includes the notebook and everything's really ready to go and the last time I taught I um, first tried getting people to install more from source because I didn't want to rely on a company and I changed my mind after I found out some of the bizarre variants on configurations that people will walk in with their laptops with. So you just go with Anaconda. Um, yeah, serving centrally is possible. I don't know anything about the security details. So, a little bit. Yeah? There's not much. Okay, okay. <laughs> so w within your firewall, maybe out in, out in the wild, only if you're feeling really, really brave. Yeah, the question was about the little navigation object, how that's being handled. That is, um, NB Viewer creates a presentation that depends on reveal.js. From that point, I believe it's the same as any other reveal.js presentation, which I don't know the details of. And I actually discovered a bug while getting this talk ready in the navigation, so I'm going to be filing it just um, with the version that NB Viewer, uh, sorry, NB Convert generates. I'm not saying there's a bug in, in reveal.js. So, question back there. Describe how uh, more than one client can connect to this at one time, one kernel, and you can collaborate on a single notebook between several people. Yes. The, the, the question was about connecting multiple people to a single notebook, um, and I didn't touch on it very thoroughly because I don't know it very well. Um, and I don't know if actually connecting multiple people to one notebook would be a good idea because I don't know how it would handle the conflicts. If somebody's saving one version, I mean, it's just a, Java, a JSON file um, being served then. Um, I think in the cases that I know of where you're connecting multiple clients to one, it's multiple clients on one machine because, um, for instance, you're, you're running it in the notebook, but then for some reason you want to inspect the process from a, a, a separate IPython process, and so you can connect that in. Or um, your IDE, you want to connect to it with your IDE. I don't know if that's... I don't know the use cases for having a different person connect to it that would be a not bad idea. And where was my slide? I thought I at least showed this slide about... Sorry, I know this is blinding to look at as I zoom through things. No, no, no. Well, the command is um, connect, un it's a magic command, percentile connect underscore info, and that at least, I can't find it, um, that at least outputs the data that you would need to connect another client to it, and actually tells a little bit about how you would do that um, for any particular session. Um, and I can't tell you much more than that because I haven't experimented much. But. Other questions? Okay, so thank you very much, and see you at the lightning talks.